All right, guys, we've been, uh, we've been talking about the law of God, God's moral law, the Ten Commandments. And we have looked at already in this introduction or preamble before we actually look at each one of the commandments that we're going to do in the future, we have been looking at um, a preamble, an introduction uh, that we believe it's important. And uh, we have said a few things about God's law already. We've talked about its nature. We've talked about its structure, its form. And then we began to talk about its context, okay? We began to talk about its context. And how many remember, well, maybe some of you were not here, but we began to say that the context in which God's moral law is given is always a covenantal context. A covenantal context is it's always the, a setting, the setting in which God's law um, is at play, is at work. Now, we uh, offered a very basic definition of covenant, a very general, a very basic, a very, let's say, um, layman's terms kind of definition for uh, covenant. <clears throat> and this is what we said. We said that a covenant is simply an arrangement or an agreement among various parties in mutual or reciprocal commitments, okay? <clears throat> so let's state that again. And the reason I'm giving you this is for you to have a framework to think. By the way, that, that's something that um, is one of the things that we want to make emphasis uh, in thinking. Hmm? Um, if we stop thinking with God's word, we lose what Christianity is about and it, it devolves into many things that Christianity is not. It devolves into mysticism. It devolves into moralism. It devolves into some type of therapeutic uh, efforts to to have a better life now, etc. So all of that happens when we set aside the task of thinking with the Word of God and studying the Word of God. <clears throat> so uh, a framework for us to think about the law of God, it's a covenantal framework, and a covenant they were saying is an agreement or an arrangement among various parties with mutual or reciprocal commitments. Now, obviously, because these covenants that we're going to be talking about, <clears throat> as, it, as it involves the creature, it has to do with the divine and the human, a relationship between a divine and the human. These covenants are God's free condescension or decision, God's free sovereign will to enter into them. In other words, God is under no constraints or necessity to have enter into the covenants that we're going to talk about. But once he decided in his free sovereign decree, purposes and will to create, he then condescended in this framework of a covenant to enter into relationship with us humans and within those relationships to um, make himself bound to reciprocal commitments, okay? <clears throat> so we'll have more to say on that and hopefully this definition will, will uh, be enriched as we continue. <laughs> So covenantal. Now, when we say covenantal, what are we talking about? What do we mean by that? Well, we, we, we are talking about two federal heads. We began to speak of two heads that are representative of two covenants that God has established. The first head is, remember Adam, 
And the second one is Christ. So these two federal, when we say federal, we're talking about representative. When these two representative heads serve a function uh, in God's historical, uh, the history of redemption, and it is in those contexts of these two covenants that God's moral law is at play or at work. Now, let's take a look at these two federal heads again as we began to discuss how they function. And we, we, uh, we went to Romans 5 to begin. And uh, these are verses that we have read, but let's refresh them real quick. In Romans 5, verses 17 through 19, we hear the following. In Romans 5, verses 17 through 19, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense Judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. So you notice there the repetition of by the one this and by the other one this and this, right? So these are two federal or two representative heads who act in the place of others. The, the actions of these two heads affect those that they represent so that <clears throat> the actions of Adam affected all of the rest of mankind. So through Adam, death entered the world. And in this passage, it says that in Adam, in Adam's disobedience, many were constituted sinners. So it's not all. Many, the reference here is to those that are in that head. And who are the many that are in Adam? All of humanity. You see, many may have reference to all, okay? But many also means more, you know, uh, um, a group, right? Yes. So a particular group pertaining to a particular class. So who are these many? Those that are born in Adam or from Adam. And that is all of humanity. So notice what it says in verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Or many were constituted sinners. So Adam stood as a representative head, and when he sinned, he brought all of mankind down with him. You see? And that's very important to keep in mind, because Adam's guilt, Adam's death, Adam's corruption has been passed down to all of his posterity. So that... We are all born in sin so that we sin, we are sinners not because we sin, we sin because we are sinners. We, we are born in this state of corruption that at some point begins to manifest itself in sinful acts. But before there's a sinful act, before there's a particular sinful act or acts, there is first a condition, a state. And that's what the Bible calls the flesh. We have inherited this corrupted flesh in Adam because the sin of Adam and his guilt was imputed to the rest of mankind. It was charged to 
the account of everyone else that was descended from Adam. And that's important to keep in mind for a doctrine of sin, because it's also a parallelism with the doctrine of salvation. Notice how it works. Adam sins, and his guilt is charged to the account of everyone that descends from him. In other words, we are born guilty in Adam. Okay? All of mankind is born under the guilt of Adam. As a result of all of mankind being guilty in Adam, we inherit in ourselves a corrupted being. And from that corrupted being flows sinful acts. So notice then what's happening there is that there is an imputation. As a result of that imputation, there is a state or a condition. And from that state or condition, there's actual sins. Okay? <clears throat> so the same thing is going to happen on the other side with Christ. When in Christ, we who are sinners are pronounced justified and not guilty and absolved, Okay, now we are in a state before God of being holy and righteous in His sight, which produces then in us fruits of obedience, fruits of righteousness, or our progressive sanctification. But it all starts from two federal heads. And that's important to keep in mind. That is the context in which we want to see our sin and our status as sinners and then our salvation. We need to have reference to these two federal heads. Let's take a look at another passage in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 21. We read there, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 21. <clears throat> 21 and 22, it says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22, For... As in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. You see now the word all? All that belong to Adam die in him. All that belong to Christ live in him. Okay, so the reference to those that are born in Adam is everybody. Because everybody is actually born in Adam. We come into this world under the guilt of our forefather with the state of corruption and eventually we begin to manifest the works of the flesh. So all of humanity is born in that state. Now, in order to be saved or to be united to the second head, we need to be born again. Born of the Spirit through faith, right? And when we are born again, or born of the Spirit, we are united to the second head. And that is Christ. And in Him, then, we live. You see? We still carry in our members the corruption of Adam, but we have been translated from guilt to forgiveness. From uh, a state of condemnation under God's law, to a state of absolution, right? Uh, being absolved from our sins, being forgiven, and being declared righteous before God. And then, through union with Christ, His death and resurrection, we begin to be able to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. So those are the implications of the two heads. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Okay? Let's take a look at another verse here. 
found in 1 Corinthians also, but now skip over to verse 45. <clears throat> skip over to verse 45 and notice what it says there in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Who is the last Adam? Christ, okay? So here's the two, the reference to the two federal or representative heads. The first man, Adam, became a living being. Why was he a living being? He was upright. He was righteous. He knew no sin, okay? That's the state in which he was created. Okay, <clears throat> but the second man, it says, uh, became a life-giving spirit. So here's a reference to something uh, deeper in, in the second head uh, in, in, the, in Christ that has to do with he that can then um, bestow the spirit of God in order to give us life, okay? That we can receive in Christ. Now, it goes on to explain, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. So, what is first? The natural. Hmm? The natural. That was the first Adam in his flesh, right? Um, is he's called the natural, the earthly, okay? The earthly. And afterward, the spiritual or the heavenly. Because Jesus Christ is not born um, of two physical parents. He's conceived of the Holy Spirit. So he is conceived from heaven. He's not conceived in the same way that all the rest of the descendants of Adam have been conceived. Even though, he, Even though he, ha he takes upon himself flesh and becomes incarnate, he is heavenly. He is spiritual. It's a different... Um, uh, he has a different uh, nature in addition to the human nature. He's also, he also has a divine nature. He is fully man and fully God. And by virtue of this, of, of who he is, and by virtue of his, of his incarnation, then he is a life-giving spirit. He can give life to sinners. Okay? <clears throat> you can actually say it. It's almost like the way Adam should have been. Well, <clears throat> Adam should have obeyed um, what he received from God the commandments that he received from God. But what we have in Christ uh, is different in nature from what we have in Adam. In what sense? Is Christ human as Adam was? Yes. Fully human. But he's also what? Fully God. Divine. And he is the one person then that can accomplish our redemption. Adam could have obeyed. Adam could have, he was created in a position to obey God and through his obedience to live. Okay? He was a living being. He had life. And we're going to see that now in other uh, passages. But Jesus Christ, the second Adam, uh, is, uh, is spiritual, is heavenly, and has a different uh, role because he comes to bring about redemption, salvation. <coughs> I think we can say that, that Adam could not do what Christ did. No. He could definitely obey. Sure. But he could also fail again. Exactly. That's exactly right. And he and Adam uh, cannot save the way that Jesus Christ can save. Adam could have obeyed and then produce offspring that would be in that same state of obedience and, and in that state of life. Of <clears throat> Definitely. Exactly. Correct. Correct. Where Christ, you know, 
That's a whole completely different. Yeah. Uh, Jesus Christ, he was human. That's why he was tempted. But he was also divine. And in that state of uh, miracle of the incarnation, he overcomes. He overcomes every temptation. He is supported by the Spirit of God and then overcomes death and condemnation, rises, and he's able then to, with the Father, grant the Spirit, bestow the Spirit in redemption, in salvation. Hmm? Yeah. So, the verse 47, the first man was of the earth, right? <clears throat> verse 47, the first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. See? And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So in, in unity with Christ, in union with Christ, then we also overcome sin and death in union with his victory. And then we will rise with Christ unto a glorified existence that is different from uh, the first Adam. So, so that we can say that it is only in the second, in the last Adam, that perfection is attained. Whereas in the first Adam, there was innocence and goodness, a state that was upright, but not perfection. Because the first Adam could lapse, could fall. He could sin, see? So he was earthly. He was, he was alive, but he was not a life-giving spirit. See, only God then in Christ now, in this last Adam, can sustain us in union with Christ in such a way, by being born again of Him, in Him, that we will not lapse and fall again and be liable to condemnation or falling away from God as the first Adam was. Does that make sense? So these are the two heads, the two representative heads that, that we have been talking about. Now, um, let's take a look then at how these two representative heads work in each one of their covenants okay let's go back to adam and go to genesis 1 <clears throat> genesis 1 oh interesting hmm hmm yeah yeah cuz uh christ is just another you know, yeah, creature. And uh, I guess according to the Mormons, we can be like little Christ and populate different worlds and things like that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So, not so. <laughs> um, so in Genesis chapter 1, we hear the following in Genesis 1, <clears throat> verse, verses 26 through 31. It says there, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed 
which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Let's now skip over to uh, chapter 2 and read verses 15 through 17. Chapter 2 of Genesis, verses 15 through 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So do you begin to see here the arrangement? Right, the, um, the agreement in which God placed uh, Adam, he created him good, he gave him dominion over creation and told him, be my garden keeper. So reflect my image, right? In my image, in my likeness, live in this world in obedience to me, right? Reflecting who I am according to the the vocation, the calling that I have given you, and in, in so doing, you will live. Okay? In so doing, you will live. But here is now a tree that you shall not eat of. Because if you eat of that tree, you will die. So what was man supposed to do? He was supposed to obey God. He was supposed to love God and obey Him. And in loving God and obeying Him, He was also loving who else? Huh? He was loving um, all that God had made. The cosmos that, that God had made for Him. Because in His obedience, He would ensure what? The well-being of the rest of creation. So that once Eve comes into the picture, he's ensuring as well in his obedience, what? The well-being uh, of others. So he's supposed to tend, to guard, to protect, right? To oversee what God has given him. And he is put there, also with this tree in the, uh, over there, that he is prohibited from. He's supposed, he can eat from all other trees except from this tree. And if he does not eat of this tree, and if he obeys the Lord, and if he follows faithfully in God's commandment to tend his garden and the world that God has created, Adam will live. Now let me show you something else that uh, that could happen to Adam in this covenant, in this arrangement in which God has placed him. Take a look at chapter 3, verse 22. Chapter 3, verse 22. This is after Adam falls. I want you to notice that in that garden, there were two trees. <clears throat> In chapter 3, verse 22, you have the following. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. You see that? Lest he put out his hand, and take also of the tree and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden and out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which it was taken. So he drove out the man. And he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of of life. So, what would have happened if he had eaten of that tree? 
he would have lived. Now, what I want you to think about is that Adam is created in this probation state. It's a probation, it's a testing of a period in which if he obeys, he'll gain access to the tree of life. You see? He'll gain access to this tree of life that would have been for confirmation of life for him and his posterity upon what? Obedience. Upon obedience, upon the fulfilling of obedience according to how God had commanded. Yeah. Would he gain access or did he already have access? He was not eating of it. Um, so according... He was, told, he was told to eat of everything. To eat of every tree, except of the, of the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil. But of this tree, we see that in the eating of this tree, there is living forever. So this tree appears then later on in Revelation and in new heavens and new earth. You see? But in Revelation, it has a, a, a seasonal function, right? Because it puts out the uh, yeah. leaves. Sure. For healing. Yeah. According to. But still, but the but the purpose is the same. is is for healing, for the healing of the nations. So um, it, it it serves a um, sort of like a type. I, we would say, you know, sort of like a sacramental function. It's it's a it's a physical reality of that life that is found in God. So notice how God is always tying Himself to certain physical aspects of of His creation. So in this probation period of Adam, if he had obeyed, he would have established himself and his posterity in righteousness through his obedience. But Adam falls short and calamity strikes uh, um, the race. And as, as in the same way, he is cut down by this tree that he eats of, then he's going to have to eat of another tree, um, you know, so to speak, uh, to speak figuratively of the tree of the cross, right? By which he is then lifted up to the tree of life by eating of Christ. So once again, what I want you to see here is the two representative heads and the drama that is playing out at original creation. Adam was supposed to live in his obedience and that is the condition that God puts him under and the sanction for disobedience is the day you eat of it, that day you shall surely die. Spiritually and physically. <laughs> physically <laughs> and... and <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. But eventually he said... He set in motion. Yeah. yeah. He was meant to live forever. So he yeah, God, God set in motion that, that event of, yeah. of sickness, of sin unto death. Yeah. Sickness unto death. The Hebrew, the Hebrew mm -hmm. scholar, he says that the terminology there in the Hebrew is, uh, that day you will die, die. It doesn't say you will surely die. Hmm. die, die, which is the understanding that dying, you will die. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the, that repetition is the way of the Hebrews to emphasize, surely. It's like you, you really die. And that encompasses, we are talking about that last night, that encompasses physical death, but more significantly, it, it, it's, it's spiritual death. The reason we die physically is because we have died spiritually. We have died spiritually. So spiritual death is the source of all physical death, separation from God and being alienated and guilty under the law of God um, triggers then physical death. So the physical death is, is, is an offshoot, an outgrowth, right? Issues from spiritual death. Pastor, can, can we even say that Adam was tempted? Absolutely. If he hadn't eaten out yeah. of the tree yet? Absolutely. Yeah, he was tempted. Tempt he make us a no, no, no. Yeah, no. Temptation. Remember, uh, temptation for Adam um, is a temptation that's coming from outside. It's a temptation coming from Satan. So Satan presents him with uh, a choice, with a question, 
with a question, uh, a choice uh, on the basis of questioning God's word, right? Has God said? Has God said? Are you sure about that? Does God have your best at heart? So what, he, what Satan does is he casts aspersions, right? On the character of God. And causes Adam and Eve to, uh, to question God's character. You know, deceives Eve. And uh, Adam follows right, right on, right through. Uh, the Bible says that Eve was deceived. And uh, doesn't say so of Adam, interestingly. So the sin of Adam uh, is not so much being deceived as wanting to follow Eve. As wanting to follow Eve. Well, but the, the, it's, it's more like in your face. Yeah. It's like Adam choosing that, what, yes. that path over obedience. So that's basically what the, the devil did with Jesus when he That's exactly, he exactly right. right. That's very good. That's very good, um, you know, because that's, that's, God puts Jesus again in, in a similar context. And the temptation that Adam did not pass and failed is a temptation that Jesus overcomes. Look at the contrast. Oh. As the, the second Adam. The second Adam is tempted in the desert. In the worst of circumstances. Fully hungry for 40 days. Adam is tempted in splendor. Comfortable. Hmm. Fed. It's to tell you that's how weak man is. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, that's the parallel. You're going to see these two heads. Notice again the drama playing out of these two heads. That's what the story of redemption is about. It's not about you first. It's about it's about God in Christ Jesus for you. And it's not about you gaining the victory. It's not about you overcoming. It's not you being the champion. It's not you defeating the powers of the enemy. You can do literally nothing. It's all about the you. <laughs> so the one that has done it is Christ for you. Amen. That's Christianity. That's what it's about. And then we live by trusting, trusting and putting our confidence daily in the one that has overcome enemies that are too big for us. We have no strength against these enemies at all. We are ruined, f fallen creatures, but Jesus Christ enters the world to overcome for us. Notice, what was Adam supposed to have done in that garden? He was supposed to be the priest. Adam was supposed to be the priest in that garden. He was supposed to consecrate the garden for Yahweh. You see? He was supposed to have consecrated the garden. He was supposed to have, what do priests do? They, they worship God. You know, they, they, they engage in the act of worship, of offering themselves unto God in worship, in praise. That's what Adam should have done. But where Adam fails, then the last or second or better priest succeeds because he consecrates himself unto God. You know, I can't help but to think, for example, let's say Adam would have been successful in, in, um, in obeying God. But then Adam's son would have also have gone through the same thing. So in other words, there will be a, a lineage of, of people that were successful and people that were not. And, and No, no, no. All I'm saying is that no. that is so uncertain. Yeah, no, no. Basically, so, remember, remember. Remember, because he was in a federal position. If he had obeyed, his posterity would have, would have been confirmed. Yeah, because he's acting on, on, in a federal position. So if he obeys, that's good for his posterity. You see? But he disobeyed, so that went bad for his descendants. So it's not like each one then would have had to, would have, had to have gone. That's why we keep saying it's about, it's about two heads. It's about two heads. These two federal heads are working out the drama of creation and redemption. 
And then we are redeemed <clears throat> in Christ, recreated, and, and Jesus Christ, in a way, recapitulates. This is language that one of the, the early fathers used, Irenaeus, I think it was, when he talked about the recapitulation. Uh, in other words, that Jesus Christ is put in the position of the first Adam in everything that the first Adam should have lived and done. So he recapitulates man, mankind, in himself. So that the first Adam could not be put, could not stay, could not establish himself as the federal head, and for all of his posterity, he failed, but Jesus Christ then becomes that head, that head upon or under which all of the cosmos then will be ordered. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so when someone thinks I can do this on my own, <laughs> they're right? deluded. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. they're thinking Adam could have done, but I can't. Yeah. Kind of thing. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Even they are. Enough, I might be. They're they're ig they're ignorant of biblical right. truth, right. and that is the state of much of the church. That's literally what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, they they have no understanding of themselves. Yeah, people argue that. Sure. You know, how come I'm judged? You know, why? I'm yeah. What somebody else did. Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing, though. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. We inherit this guilt and this corruption, but we're all going to be judged on the basis of our works. So, so everybody that has been born will be judged on the basis of their own sinful works and acts. They're born guilty and sinful on the basis of the first Adam. But they will be, they will stand in the presence of God and they will not be able to say to God, oh, I'm sorry, but I didn't sin. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I, I couldn't act. You know, I wanted not to sin, but I was held captive to your to Adam, no, you didn't you didn't you sin with your will, with your affections? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, you. you, you yeah. My, my question is, for example, because the first <clears throat> thing you hear right after that is like, why did I get a chance to yeah. do that? Right? Mm -hmm. Instead of mm -hmm. saying, you know, oh, here's Christ, I don't mm -hmm. even have to do that. Right, right. Or, or even, even, uh, not only that, the way that the way that Paul answers that in Romans nine is, who are you? I mean, God, God really gets uh, <laughs> really tied in this. He says, who are you to reply against God? He says, you know, to reply against the potter. That's the way that God designed it and laid it all out. We rebel against it. Why is that? Because of our human notions of, uh, of righteousness, of justice, of fairness. What is the, what is the word of... Uh, uh, a key word in this generation, it's not fair. fair. If I don't hear that a, a dozen times a day from sometimes kids, right? We don't hear it once. It's yeah, not, if we get what's fair. It's not yeah. fair. If, but the tragedy is that, that we, adults have also imbibed that. It's not fair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> usually, the re mm -hmm. usually the reply yeah. back is life isn't fair. Yeah. Usually they're like, well, it's not fair. Well, <clears throat> Hmm. So, uh, remember, we were created in, a in Adam. Adam, not only was Adam our federal head, what that entails and involves is that if we had been in his position, we would have done the exactly the same thing. So he represents us in such a way that had it been us, we wouldn't have acted differently. He, represent, he represent, represents us as that first human alive um, head. And then we need a savior. See, we need a savior. But the point that I wanted to add there is that we're, we're all going to be judged on the basis of our own sinfulness and of our own works. That is why hell is not going to be the same for everyone. There's going to be different degrees of what? Um, of consequences, of eternal um, consequences in hell on the basis of what? Transgressions.
on the basis of the light of, uh, of knowledge that each one had, on the basis of, of uh, how much um, um, understanding and knowledge persons had. It's not going to be the same God. In other words, you can rest assured that God is just. God will be just. There's only two things to get from God. One, you either get justice or you get grace. If you get justice, you, you don't want to get that. Because in justice, you get what? Deserve. You get what you deserve. And you don't deserve nothing but hell. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Then we're talking about a Savior. We who deserve hell hear of the kindness and the love of God to send a second federal head to save us, not by what we can do. He knows that we can do nothing. So he sends someone that can do it for us. So that then when we cry out to him and say, please save me, have mercy on me, a sinner, he says, boom, yeah, I save you. I forgive you. I receive you unto myself. Like you said, that we're sheep. Yeah, we are sheep. But we think we're lions or, you know, tigers or, yeah, super, super humans and things like that, right? No, we're not. We're dust. We're of the earth. We have fallen. We're in a ruined state. We're not good. There's corruption in our hearts. Um, the flesh is always driving us away from God. But, but we, we have a Savior, and in Him, then we are redeemed, delivered from guilt, delivered from condemnation. Now God removes the guilt from over us, removes us from a state of condemnation. And even though now he doesn't remove corruption yet, because he has united us with Christ by his spirit, now we receive a new nature, meaning in union with Christ, we are able now to obey God and to bear the fruit of the spirit, which opposes the flesh now and pushes against the works of the flesh in hope and anticipation of the day when the flesh, meaning our sinful nature, shall be done away with, and we will receive a new body that in the presence of God, in new creation, will live in righteousness, in holiness, without sin, in everlasting life, forever. But not in the state of the first Adam, because we will not be liable to what? To fall anymore. No more probation. That is past. That is the first and the, the first order of things. You know, the probation that Adam was under and that Jesus Christ kept and fulfilled redeemed us for a new creation in which now we enjoy blessedness and life everlasting forever. In union with Christ. And that's what we're going to see next uh, week. We have seen the first Adam. We're going to focus next week on the last Adam. In other words, in Christ. We have looked at the first federal head. We're going to look next week at the second Adam. And we're going to see then how he brings us into this blessedness of eternal life. By his work, but we began to talk about it in the sense that he uh, is put under these temptations in a, gar in a fallen garden, and he has to go through the Garden of Gethsemane, right, and take the curses that Adam received, take it upon himself, so that new creation may arise. So that we sinners, fallen creatures, may receive from Christ now under different terms. Not anymore under the terms of the law, but under the terms of faith. Through the one that has obeyed the law on our behalf. Does that make sense? So we'll unfold that uh, next, uh, next week. Let's any questions to end? 
so that we can move on to our next meeting. <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Father, we need you, Lord. Father, help us to understand our place in this drama of redemption. Help us to understand your mind, your ways. Father, that we may be truly grounded and edified in truth. The truth that is actually able to make us live, to help us live in abundance, even now, by your Spirit. For we have been delivered from all our enemies in and through Christ. Oh, Father, help us. Help us that we may ponder and treasure these blessings and truths in our hearts and that we may continue to grow thereby. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.